Hello, everybody. Welcome to Gas to Grass, an official event of the Michigan State University Science Festival. My name is Lucas. I'm a sophomore at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I work at the Wisconsin Energy Institute as an education and outreach programming assistant. And hi, everyone. My name is Alana Rapp. I also go to the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm a senior studying environmental science and German, and I also work at the Wisconsin Energy Institute with Lucas. So in this fermentation experiment, we're going to be answering and asking the question, how do you run cars on plants? Spoiler alert, it is possible and it's actually being done everywhere around the world. But first, I'd like to give some background on the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center, who we are here representing. The GLBRC is a U.S. Department of Energy funded bioenergy research center led by the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Here, over 400 individuals from campuses all around the country study uh, how to achieve the goal of creating biofuels and bioproducts that are, that are economically viable and environmentally sustainable. So just to go over our plan for today, we're gonna to start off with some context for this experiment and exploring some scientific concepts. Then we'll review the materials you'll need for this experiment. We'll set it up, record some observations, and then finally record our results and talk about them. Because this is a pre-recorded activity, there will be no Q&A, and we'll give you guys some emails uh, that you can contact if you do have questions. And if you have the PDF with instructions for this activity, you can pull that out here to reference. So have you guys ever seen uh, any one of these around in your neighborhood in the last week or up in the sky? Maybe you've had something delivered by one of them. Well, it's fairly likely that you have. Um, they're quite common. Uh, all of these forms of transportation have to run on something, right? They're fueled by an energy source. Most commonly, these fuels are derived from petroleum. It is used to make gasoline and diesel for cars and trucks, other more energy dense fuels for planes and ships, and so many other products like tires, medicine, plastics, and fabrics like polyester. But petroleum leads to the release of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere uh, as it is being used. And every gallon of gasoline burned releases about 20 pounds of CO2 into the atmosphere. The release of CO2 is very problematic because it is a greenhouse gas. So to understand CO2's role as a greenhouse gas, we must first understand how our planet receives heat energy in the first place. So the sun is the source of heat energy received by Earth. Sunlight shines onto the planet and in the form of light waves, it transfers heat. You can feel it yourself on a hot summer day if you're standing out in the sun. Not all of the sun's rays that reach the Earth's surface, however, are absorbed by it. Some of the sun's energy is also radiated back into space in the form of infrared waves. Many of these sun rays uh, are reflected all the way back to outer space. However, some of them will be trapped by the gases in our atmosphere, creating a sort of insulative layer around Earth that keeps it warm, kind of like a blanket. As a natural phenomenon, the greenhouse gas effect is necessary for life on Earth. However, certain gases like CO2 magnify this greenhouse gas effect by increasing the amount of reflected rays that get trapped in the atmosphere, thus warming the Earth to an unnatural and unsafe degree. So here, is, here are two diagrams depicting the difference between the effects of the natural and human influenced greenhouse gas effects. On a cool night, on a cool fall night, for example, you might want to uh, have one blanket, but if you were to have five, then you would be too warm. A similar uh, phenomenon is going on here. With the increase in greenhouse gases, Earth is getting too hot and we can observe warming trends all over the world. So global temperatures are rising, as is shown in red on this map. So the more red that you see in an area, the faster it has been warming since 1990. And as expected, um, CO2 levels have also been rising with, uh, along with the temperature. So these two phenomena are linked. They run kind of in parallel. As we've seen the CO2 emissions rising, we've also seen the temperatures across the world rising. So as we discussed, cars, trucks, planes, and other forms of transportation are major users of fossil fuels and are thus responsible for a large portion of the greenhouse gas emissions. So a major challenge we're facing right now is figuring out how we can address this issue. Uh, one method the researchers are working on is developing fuels that are made out of plants instead of petroleum. So these fuels are called biofuels, and they function basically the same way that the normal fossil fuels that we're used to do. 
they fuel our vehicles and they emit carbon dioxide into the atmosphere as a byproduct. But the big difference between biofuels and fossil fuels is that biofuels are made from plants, which helps cycle the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere instead of just leaving it there to accumulate like fossil fuels do. So how exactly does this process work? Well, as you guys probably know, plants undergo photosynthesis, where they absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere along with water to make the things that they need to grow and survive. And because of this process of photosynthesis, biofuels are essentially a carbon neutral fuel. The plants that are used to make biofuels help sequester carbon, take it out of the atmosphere, and then those biofuels emit the CO2 back into the atmosphere only to get reabsorbed by those plants. So there's no net addition of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, whereas with normal fossil fuels, they'll just keep accumulating and accumulating in the atmosphere. Now, how exactly do we make fuels from plants? Unfortunately, we can't just stick plants into our gas tanks and hope they work, right? We have to come up with ways to chemically convert plants into fuels. So take a second right now and see if you could guess what this is. Notice the five micrometer indicator on the bottom right corner. That means this thing is very tiny. Just see if you could guess what it is. So this thing is baker's yeast, which has been used by people for thousands and thousands of years to make things like bread and beer and wine because it ferments sugar. So what exactly does this process look like? Well, glucose or sugar is fed to the yeast, which consumes it and produces ethanol, which is a biofuel, in addition to carbon dioxide as a byproduct. So now we'll begin with the experiment portion of this lesson. For your fermentation experiment, you'll need the following materials, baker's yeast, warm water, one teaspoon measuring spoons, something to me measure a fourth a cup of water, feedstocks, which we'll discuss what exactly we mean by that in the next slide, and then resealable sort of snack sized Ziploc bags. So as small as you can kind of find, if they're a little bit bigger, that's not a problem either. You can use a bit more of the ingredients. Um, but yeah, as small as you can find, and then paper towels as well, in case anything gets spilled. So uh, feedstock, what exactly do we mean by that? Well, feedstock is the term that we use to describe what we are feeding, the yeast. So as Lucas said, yeast are tiny living microorganisms that need to eat to survive. And as we saw in the fermentation process diagram, it is the yeast eating the feedstock that allows for the reaction to occur to create biofuel. So here we have a few examples of feedstocks that you can use if you have them around your house, including sugar, granulated sugar, cornmeal, sawdust, leaves and stems, you could go outside and gather some of these cereal if you have any, you could grind them down and use sort of like the powder or anything else that you can that you can think of that might be a good, good feedstock. So be, feel free to be creative, use what you have around in your house and um, feel free to pause the video at this time to go and collect your various materials. So now that we have all of our assembled materials, let's set up our experiment. First is to, the first step is to take one teaspoon of a feedstock. We recommend you start with sugar for your first bag and put that into the plastic Ziploc bag that you have. So measure out one teaspoon of sugar and put that into your Ziploc bag. And then uh, measure out one teaspoon of yeast when you have that in front of you and put that into your bag as well in addition to the sugar. And then uh, lastly, one fourth a cup of warm tap water. So yeah, be careful with this part, easy to spill. <laughs> try, try to get it into your bag with your sugar and your yeast. And then once all three of those are in the bag, go ahead and seal it up, trying not to get uh, air in it if possible, trying, trying to leave as little air in the bag as you can. And then once it's fully sealed, mix it very gently, just kind of tilt the bag back and forth or move it around with your fingers a bit to try and get the yeast and the sugar and the water to be sort of mixed together. So once you've completed this step, feel free to do the same with any other feedstocks that you're able to gather um, and then set those aside and we will return to them in a bit. So the big question that we're trying to answer with our experiment is which feedstock will the yeast ferment the best? So what exactly does ferment the best even mean? 
this is something that we'll be thinking about as we continue with our experiment. Feel free to think about it yourself and try and kind of uh, hypothesize what you think that might mean. Uh, if you only had uh, access to sugar as well uh, and not those other feedstocks, that's okay. You can, instead of comparing which type of feedstock ferments the best, you can just focus on observing the what's happening in your sugar bag. So now let's make a hypothesis. Uh, a hypothesis is an educated guess, and it often comes in the common structure of an if-then statement. So if I observe something happening, then this will be the result. So for example, you can say, if a bag, the bag with cornmeal puffs up more than the bag with leaves, then that means that cornmeal ferments better than the leaves. So in this case, we're kind of equating ferments best to seeing a lot of air forming in the bag, but you guys can kind of see what you think that might mean as we go on uh, with the experiment. So feel free to write down that hypothesis at the top of a piece of paper if you have access to one and um, pause the video if you'd like and write that at the top of the paper and then divide the remaining part of the paper into as many sections as you have feedstocks. So if you're able to find four feedstocks, go ahead and mark it into four sections and then write the name of each feedstock in each section. And uh, once you've had all of your bags filled and you have them in front of you, you could make um, some preliminary observations of changes that you might see happening in these bags and write that on this piece of paper in each of the corresponding sections. So that's a big part of any sort of science experiment that scientists will practice is first making a hypothesis. And then once you've set it up, making observations as you watch your experiment progress, what you're seeing. So right now your yeast is producing ethanol, which is the most common mass produced biofuel. About 10% of the gas that we buy at gas stations is comprised of ethanol. and ethanol is produced from corn, which our research center doesn't study for several reasons. First off, we've pretty much already got it figured out. The process of converting corn into ethanol is already being done on a large scale all over the world. Also, corn is food, and we don't want to take up valuable agricultural land that could otherwise be used to feed people. Third, and lastly, it takes a lot of energy to grow corn, and often lots of fertilizer as well. So at the GLBRC, we want to tackle challenges that haven't really been solved yet. And we want to find ways to grow plants for biofuel use without using agricultural land. So right now you may notice some changes occurring in your bags. So now would be a good time to pause the video and make any additional observations that you want. So how exactly do we know which feedstock ferments the best? If you'll remember earlier in this presentation, I said that carbon dioxide is a byproduct of the fermentation process. And carbon dioxide is a gas. So as your bags start to puff up and they start to fill with gas, you can use that as an indicator of how much fermentation is going on. And the amount of fermentation that's happening has to do with what the yeast can break down and what it can't. Some things are harder and some things are easier depending on their chemical composition. Here's an analogy to explain what I just said. Imagine if you tried to eat a whole raw potato I do not suggest you do that. You will not have a good time doing it. But if you diced and cooked the potato instead, it would be really easy to do. And the same goes for yeast. We can introduce enzymes to complex chemical compounds that break them down to make them easier for the yeast to eat. Additionally, we can heat up those chemical compounds because increasing the temperature increases the rate of the chemical reactions that take place, including fermentation. So feedstock number one here, which is sugar, is the easiest for the yeast to ferment because that's what the yeast likes to eat the most, right? Next up is cornmeal. And cornmeal is basically just a ton of sugar molecules linked together to form long chains. So the chemical structure is pretty similar to sugar. So yeast will still easily be able to break that down, but it'll be a little harder than just breaking down straight sugar. Next, we have corn stover, which has kind of a different chemical composition than glucose does. So that means the yeast is gonna have an even harder time fermenting that. And then finally, we have sawdust. You might notice that your sawdust bag barely inflates at all, if at all. And sawdust contains lots of chemical compounds like lignin and also cellulose that make it really hard for these to digest as well. So I started a bag a bit earlier um, before we began the presentation. And so you guys might not see that your bags are this inflated yet, but mine had pretty much no air in it before. And now it's very big and puffed up. So this this is kind of an example of what you might 
see eventually happening with your bags and sort of a lot of bubbles at the top of uh, where the liquid is in the bag. My experiment just started and I'm, and I'm already starting to notice it uh, inflate a little bit. So this activity is just an introduction to fermentation and biofuels, but there are still so many more questions we have to answer. At the GLBRC, we're studying which plants are the best to make biofuels out of, how to grow and cook those plants so we can make the most amount of biofuel with the least amount of resources, and also which microbes best facilitate that fermentation and facilitate the production of biofuels. We're also studying how to genetically modify those microbes so they could be as efficient as possible. So thank you guys so much for your participation today. There are some emails for you to contact if you have additional questions about this activity. And there's also a website for the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center in case you'd like to learn more about it. Again, thank you so much for your participation and I hope you enjoy the rest of the science festival. Thank you.